Hi everybody and um, welcome to our Talks on Tuesday webinar for May. Um, my name is Dana Childress and I work with the Integrated Training Collaborative at the Partnership for People with Disabilities. Um, and I'm pretty excited about today's webinar. We're talking about a great topic that um, from what we hear has been one that's been really interested and needed by a lot of you. So we're excited to, to share this today. Um, we're going to talk about approaching families about early mental health care. Today we'll talk about risk factors and you'll get lots of strategies you can use when talking with families about early mental health care. We've actually chosen this topic for several reasons. First, we wanted to recognize that May is Children's Mental Health Awareness Month in Virginia. And we also wanted to be responsive to quite a few requests we've received from you all for a webinar on early childhood mental health. Um, this topic actually also came up at the most recent VIC meeting. For those of you that don't know, VIC stands for Virginia Interagency Coordinating Council. And so that was just, I guess, two months ago or so. And so we are so delighted that the stars have aligned and we've been able to present this topic with you. We're really happy to have our presenter today who has a wealth of experience about this topic and about early intervention. And we're, ha we're so happy to have Jeannie Odachowski presenting with us today. Some of you might recognize her name. Jeannie's a former local system manager here in Virginia. Um, and she's um, so really got a great knowledge not only about early childhood mental health, but about what it looks like to do the job that you do. So I'm actually going to turn, go ahead and turn things over to Jeannie who will tell us a little bit more about herself um, and then just launch right into the webinar. So again, um, as we've talked about um, with our past webinars today, I want to invite those of you that are listening to feel free to use the chat box to type in your comments and your questions. Jeannie will try to answer some of them as we're going along. I'll certainly be monitoring questions and we'll hopefully have a little time at the end to answer some questions too. Feel free to um, put your thoughts into chat and just keep an eye on and confidentiality um, because you know this is a sensitive topic and please make sure your whatever you type into chat um, does not uh, provide any information about the family. So with that said, um, we, thank you so much Jeannie for presenting with us today. Let me go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Good afternoon everybody. I'm Jeannie Odachowski. Um, whoops. Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought we got a little too far there. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a licensed professional counselor and I'm the regional director for the Martinsville, Virginia Office of Family Preservation Services. From 1984 until 2002, I worked in early intervention in the Piedmont region of the state, covering three counties and one town city um, of Martinsville. I started out in early intervention and was a home visitor. Uh, and then I became a program manager and then a system manager, which is um, you know, the person who sort of gains all the collaboration of all the agencies involved in Part C. That was way back when Part C was really still Part H. Um, but the training that I got when I worked in early intervention was a little sporadic. But when I found Michael Trout and I started listening to him talk about infant mental health, that was what really got me fired up about all of the, um, the possibilities in working with families because I had seen by that time a lot of stress in families and a lot of risk factors that were affecting kids' development. So he was able to talk about the process of mental health in a way that really hit home with me. I got my master's degree in counselor education and I left early intervention for a little while to get my clinical supervision and my license and that was really hard but I'm glad I did it because I worked with children and adults from birth to 74 in my outpatient practice and my intensive in-home practice. And so that gave me a lot of experience in seeing how how people develop over time and how a lot of times the roots of people's mental illness are in their childhood. And their stories that I would listen to were just amazing and frightening sometimes, but it really taught me an awful lot. So their relationships with parents and other family members really made a tremendous impact on them. So I have learned a tremendous amount of people and um, so this has really helped me in my life. So the um, Today, I'm also, in addition to being a regional director here, I sit on that Virginia Interagency Coordinating Council, and that came, that's how I got started doing this topic today. So we're going to launch right into it. We'd like for you to please just read this definition of infant mental health and then raise your hand when you have a chance to finish it and kind of process a little bit. So 
but to raise your hand, what you'll do is you'll look to the left of the slide in your participant box, um, which has, has your name or the name that you signed in with. You'll see below that um, there's four small boxes. The third box to the right has a little hand that you see kind of the palm. Um, click that button, click the hand button, and that will raise your hand and let Jeannie know when you're done reading the definition. Okay. I see a lot, not quite everybody, but that's good. Yeah, I think we're good, Jeannie. I think you're welcome to keep going. Okay. Um, so in the literature, what I've read is that infant mental health is really synonymous with healthy social and emotional development. So I would really encourage people, you know, when they're looking at this information, to go to that CEPL website, which is the Center on the Social and Emotional Foundations for Learning. Um, and I've referenced that in the resource list. And read some of the articles that they've got there. That's where I pulled this definition from. And actually, in my looking to see whose definition it truly was, I believe it came from Zero to Three, which is another great resource on infant mental health. So I really encourage you to check their website as well. They have lots of free things that you can get, things you can order and pay for, but lots of free stuff. Um, so we really are looking at children's capacity from birth to three to experience and manage their emotions. So when we look at what those basic elements of infant mental health and healthy social emotional development are, who can give me in the chat box, if you would, just a couple of things um, that you think are some of the most important basic elements of healthy social emotional development? All right. It looks like most people have focused on the chat on trusting relationships, attachment, uh, one kind of central primary caregiver, safety and bonding, um, parent connection. So a lot of that has to do with attachment and security and having their basic needs met, which I would all agree are very important things. And we're going to talk about a lot of that as we kind of go through. I've got my little star pointer thing that's kind of getting in my way there. Um, throughout the presentation, I'll be talking about the impact of risk factors also on how all of these things occur, and those attachment um, opportunities and ability to learn to self-regulate. Um, so, and we're going to talk about just how those risk factors impact, and we're not going to focus a whole lot on what those look like, but how we can address those with families. And then at the end, we'll ask you what some of your thoughts are on how this information is going to inform how you continue to work with families. So when we look at this, we've all talked about relationships here. We've talked about attachment and bonding. And I would submit really that all of these um, have some impact on the relationship. So if you would take your pointer and pick the factor that you think has the greatest impact on the future of a child's mental health and maybe on their relationships, would you use your pointer and point to one of those now? So to access your pointer tool, you'll look to the left of the slide. You'll see a vertical toolbar. The second box down from that vertical toolbar typically has a starburst or a smiley face or a check mark in it. Yeah, I see people are using it. For those <laughs> of you that haven't, you clicked on that second box and then you move your cursor over to the screen and just click again to drop your pointer in the box of your choice. Keep in mind that you can only drop one pointer on the screen. It looks like Jeannie, you've got a lot of lot of drop pointers going now. Yeah, yeah. A lot on relationships, a few on stable environments and one on clear communication. That's great. Okay. All right. So 
you can see there are a lot of different things that will impact the child's future mental health. It's a wonder any of us kind of get through and, and are healthy when we grow up, it seems like to me. Um, but our relationships, I think, are impacted by all of those other things. Um, I mean, if you can't have the very first part of that, which is the relationship, that's the key thing. And then to have all of those other areas to be healthy, um, you know, it's, it's not – the tipping point, I think, comes when a lot of those things kind of fall off the wagon. Um, but our relationships with our primary caregivers set the stage for all our future relationships. All of these factors impact each other. Relationships are affected by temperament. Our relationships are affected by our ability to communicate, our cues back and forth between mother and baby or father and baby. Um, the maternal mental health factor is huge. I mean, if a mom is depressed or something like that, it may be harder for her to develop that relationship with the parent or the child. Um, and then how the symptoms of the mental illness are managed or not managed really impacts that relationship. And then, of course, physical health of the child and the mother are both important too. The baby might have significant health issues as a result of the birth process or whatever's going on, complications from what other developmental or genetic issue they might have. And the mother might be having a hard time recovering from the birth as well. Um, and then, of course, a stable environment is huge and having, um, a, you know, our families move around a lot sometimes due to changes in employment, family situations, effects of poverty, those kinds of things. Those can kind of create um, issues where there might be some um, lack of stability and some rootlessness. And then, of course, traumatic events can impact development and relationships also. So here is, um, oh, sorry, I got my slide out of order just a little bit. Here comes the baby. Um, you know, all the parents ha that have babies have dreams about what their child will be when they grow up. Uh, so having a baby with a severe developmental or intellectual disability can be crushing for some families. Most families will rise to the challenge and grow into the kind of parent they need to be for their child, even if that takes some time. And it's on us to be patient with them and give them that time, I think. Um, I worked with a little girl who had Down syndrome a long time ago. And she was just the apple of her daddy's eye. And he was there for most all of the home visits. He shared that it was really hard for his wife to accept the reality of her daughter's diagnosis. So I tried to work with mom too. She was not there as much as for the visits as he was. And she did work outside the home. So I think that you know, certainly had an impact on it. But I think part of that was it was just hard for her. So since I knew she was really struggling, one of the things I tried to do was to kind of meet her where she was. I tried to call pretty regularly and just make t contact with her, let her know some of the really neat things her child was learning. And I know that her dad was doing that too, but I think it's important sometimes when somebody else besides another parent recognizes all the great things that they're learning and to be excited about what they're doing. So we built that relationship mostly on the phone, somewhat in person, but mostly by phone. And I was able to work with Sarah for three years of early intervention. So toward the end of that time, mom started being at more of the visits. She became more involved with our services. And during the end, um, the last visit that I had, and we were you know, kind of talking about discharge and again, and what kinds of information she was going to need for the future. And she really sort of talk, talked about a little bit about how hard it was for her and how she struggled with that diagnosis that her child had for a long time. So she would finally been able to get through some of her grief of having a child that she was not expected to be having and to have a closer relationship with her daughter. So I still see her sometimes around how she's very proud of her daughter and they're doing really wonderful. But we just need to remember that people have to kind of get there in their own time because these kids are not necessarily the kids they plan to have. But for some families it's grief, for some families it's poverty, lack of stability, hospitalization, and a lot of other things that factor into the development of the child's mental health. So tell me a little bit in your chat box, if you would, what your biggest concerns are about engaging a family in a conversation about their child's mental health. You can just type in your chat box what your biggest worries are.
Okay. There's a lot there that people are concerned about. Some of them, um, as I'm sure you could see in the chat, but do people worry about their scope of practice and whether or not they have the training to have this conversation, whether or not the family will be offended, um, if there's a stigma attached to it, um, that there aren't any providers in their area, uh, and that mental health was not the family's primary concern. Uh, when they came in and their openness to the conversation. So I, I would agree that all of those things are worries. Um, and I think it's also incumbent on us as providers of early intervention to make sure that we address all areas of development, not just the ones that brought the child into services. So I want to ask... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I thought we lost you. I just want to make sure everything oh. was okay. You're fine. Oh, no, everything's fine. Did everybody not hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Go ahead. I would ask just sort of a rhetorical question. If people think that the, that the opposite of mental health is mental illness, and I ask that because I really think that sometimes people assume that, that if a person uh, doesn't have what we consider to be mental health, that they are mentally ill. And I kind of see this on a continuum instead of that. It's not an either or proposition. Some people have mild depression. Sometimes others have deep depression with hopelessness and that might become suicidal. Others might have some anxiety over public speaking or entertaining in their home. Some people have such grave anxiety that they have panic attacks where they actually think they are going to die. So you know, there is a really wide variety of types of mental health, types of mental illness, and I'm sure that most of you all know some of that. So, when we worry about saying the wrong thing or that we might make the family opt out of services or in some way offend them, and I do think sometimes that might happen. So you can't always know how your words are going to be received. However, that being said, I think more often than not, we can get to a place where we can be open with families about our concerns. And let's look at how we might have that conversation by educating ourselves on the risks and benefits of that discussion. It is our job to have these conversations even where we're afraid of the consequences. Sometimes the consequences of not having the discussion are greater than those of having the discussion. And you might offend somebody and somebody might opt out of services. But it also may bring them back into services when they get deeper concerns or something else happens in their family and they realize they might need a little bit different help. I also want to talk about reframing this discussion. And I see your question about that tool in the chat box. So we'll talk about that a little bit further when we get in to this conversation. Um, mental health treatment sometimes uses a technique called reframing. If you look at an event or a thought with someone and you help them see it in a different way, a little bit less pathological, um, so that it's not um, like a heart-stopping kind of conversation. It's more of a, well, let's look at it this way and see if we can see what the good in this situation might be. So I want to reframe the discussion, in this particular discussion, in terms of social-emotional health and let you know how great an opportunity you have to have an impact on the mental health of young children that you come in contact with. And as I said before, it is a healthy social-emotional development is synonymous with infant mental health. So when we're talking about the social and emotional development and growth, it's not nearly as terrifying as talking about mental health in terms of the impact it has on families. One of the ways you can help families is to help teach them about what healthy social and emotional development looks like, the kinds of things that can have impact on, how it affects long-term development, behavior, physical health, and mental health. So if you're able to incorporate this kind of information in your visits with families all the time, then you see something that concerns you. It just naturally becomes part of that conversation that you're having. It's not as scary for you or for the parent that way. And it frames the conversation for you in terms of developmental issues that you're looking at. So most of this we're going to talk about focuses on what you as a provider can do, and hopefully it will help you be more comfortable sharing information and knowing when to ask a family if you can refer them for additional services, or if they, you know, if it's one of those things like that really needs more help. I also want to add that just in order to do this, you don't have to have any particular training. You don't have to be a licensed mental health person. You can talk to them about what healthy development is in this area and help them learn to kind of reflect on their child's development and how it's progressing. 
So let's talk a little bit about assessments and what what assessments or screening tools do you guys, and I don't want to know the name of the assessment necessarily, although that one person might, what does your assessment tool tell you about social emotional development and about the child in that particular area? And we can chat if you will, just to give me a couple of ideas about what your screening tool tells you. Okay. I don't know if everybody's gotten something in. Right, there's one person who feels like they need a, another assessment that gives more information. A um, couple of people. Um, other people say it gives them information about how they use their primary caregiver as their home base or their secure base. Turn taking, eye contact, social communication, atypical development. Functioning in relation to peer groups and their interactions. Okay, so all of that information that you get your assessment from your assessment it helps you determine what the specific outcomes will be for that child. So it may point to some areas where they need additional help in learning to communicate or learning more about attachment for the parent and the child and how the child needs to develop that secure base for exploration of the environment and that sort of thing. Um, and how clear or not clear a child's communication cues might be, um, if a child's able to take turns and have interaction that even from the beginning of playing peekaboo or waving bye-bye or any of those kind of turn-taking kind of games. So we can really look at that really early on and whether or not the child makes eye contact and that sort of thing. Um, when they're interacting with their parent. And I did I just did think of an assessment a little bit and I'll just answer that question real quick. For um, some kids that might have more serious uh, traumatic events and that sort of thing, there is a um, a screening tool called the ACE uh, screening tool, it's adverse childhood experiences. And I forgot to put that on the um, resource list, so I'll try to type that in at the very end so you'll have that information. All right, so we are going to use um, these global child outcomes are what we are measuring as a state. So we're looking at these three areas to see how we're making headway with children and their outcomes and if we're being successful as a system in terms of what we're doing for children. Um, so if a child lacks the ability to have um, positive social skills, emotional management, the ability to acquire skills um, through the development of the laser, any of these risk factors that we're going to talk about, they won't be able to meet their individual goals. And so we need to figure out um, how we can help them in that area. So if there are questions about whether infant mental health is the right place in Part C to be a service, I think that we can offer a lot of education on what mental health, infant mental health is and how it ties in to all of these child outcomes that we are looking at. Um, the early intervention provider is in a really unique position to give the rest of the child's team some input on what they see in, their, in a child's home, what their observations are of all the really great things that are going on, and then the concerning things they see going on as well. Um, and you can involve uh, additional services if necessary through the service coordinator um, according to what the child's needs are and what the family's needs are. 
And when you frame that conversation in terms of child outcome, it also, you know, once you're talking about healthy social and emotional development, it takes the mental health scary part out of it and it gives you an opportunity to talk about the basics of that healthy social and emotional development and to provide education to families that are not informed about why these areas might be so vitally important to their child in terms of later success. And that's, I think, where we always have to look at this. Healthy social and emotional development and infant mental health are going to frame that child's later success in life. So in order for this to be effective, our service coordinators have to be really closely involved with the family and help guide a discussion as to how to achieve these specific outcomes. So let's look at the risk factors a little bit. Um, there are risk factors of stability um, that we look at and how these can impact um, a child's social emotional development. One of the things you can do as a provider to help minimize this instability or at least help the family understand the impact of it on their child is to talk about you know, maybe separation. If there's separation from parents and um, their children or their, um, the child is living with a grandparent or a foster family or um, maybe it's the dad who's absent and they're living with mom, it doesn't really matter why they're separated as much or when, as much as it's just the fact of the separation, um, really has an impact on those kids and how a child grieves for their parents. So we want, as providers, to help the caregiver that they have now see how these things affect the child. And a good way to do that is kind of talk to the present caregiver and wonder with them what they think about whether the child misses their family, if there's a person who's absent from them, um, do they think that they miss their mother or father, or um, I wonder how this is going to affect little Susie to grow up without being in her mom's care or um, being placed in a foster home this early on. Because I think sometimes people don't think that if a child can talk, and say how upset they are, that it doesn't have the same impact. And so we want people to understand that from a very, very early age, kids grieve for their parents if they're not there. Um, and so you might also use some examples of loss in their own family and say, gosh, you know, how, did, how was it that you overcame this loss and what kinds of things did you do? And will this be able to be possible for this child also. And then we also have families who have um, kids with multiple caregivers. So wonder what you guys think would be the impact of having multiple caregivers taking care of your child throughout the day, the week, the month. If you can put a couple of ideas in the chat box there, tell me what you think about multiple caregivers. Okay, I've got several ideas. Um, talking about inconsist inconsistent structure, rules and expectations, lack of consistency seems to really be a theme. Um, confusing expectations, it's hard on the children, um, and predictability being important. So I think most people would agree that from what y'all have put in there that the inconsistency that arises from multiple caregivers is really difficult for kids. And I agree, that's right. Um, when I think sometimes parents, you know, with the best of intentions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but maybe they have trouble finding uh, stable child care. And so some days the child's at grandma's, sometimes the child is with the aunt, sometimes they might be with a close friend, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's there. And, you know, they maybe need to work 
and can't find or can't afford a daycare center where there's more consistency and that sort of thing. So we understand those things, but I think we also can provide some anticipatory guidance for families about how these things might affect a child's development. Um, so it might not matter, you know, they might think, well, you know, grandma loves him, his aunt loves him, my best friend loves him all the same, and so he'll be safe and well cared for. And that's probably true, that they'll be safe and well cared for. But the expectations are different. So a child may develop problems with eating, sleeping, uh, different kinds of activities or behaviors. So you might be able then to give that anticipatory guidance and say, gee, I wonder if um, the difference from the expectations at grandma's house and the sleeping arrangements at grandma's house and how she feeds him and what she feeds him is maybe different than what he gets at his aunt's house or your friend's house and maybe that's confusing for him. And you can say those things in such a way that they are, you know, you're kind of wondering with them, could this be the thing that's impacting your child? Could this be the thing that's, you know, is it difference in expectations? Who's the child wondering, who's going to help me if I get upset? You know, if I need comfort, who is going to comfort me? Um, and so helping people understand those kinds of things, helping them remember that children um, who are, um, just from pillar to post all the time, just have difficulty with expectation and understanding um, what's going to be consistent for them and how important that is. Um, so the other thing you can look for is some behavior that might be very concerning, like uh, for older kids, hiding food, lying, stealing, um, a lot of temper tantrums, you know, more so than what you might think would be typical for these kids. Um, and then difficulties in regulating activity. Those are real indicators that the child's really struggling with something. So it's a good time to talk to the family about maybe a more in-depth evaluation or some changes that they might try first to minimize some of these situations so that their child is doing better. Um, and then, of course, talking to them about multiple moves. And a lot of times people are moving because there are problems with employment or problems with housing. So that's where we, we kind of have to help them solve some problems in that way. So then we have parental factors also where a parent or caregiver has mental health problems of their own. Um, and providing them information with, in this area is important to help understand what their child's needs are. So if a parent is open enough to say to you that they have a, their own mental illness or their own mental health problems, I would go ahead and say, you know, how does this affect your relationships? What kind of symptoms do you have? And how do they, how do you try to manage them? Are you on medicine? Do you see a doctor? Do you see a counselor? You know, if a person is open enough with you to say these things, then I think it's incumbent on us to kind of ask some of those questions. Um, they do need to understand that you, you know, in certain situations might have to make a Child Protective Services report. But uh, that's not the primary here. The primary thing is to help them problem solve around what their symptoms are and help them make a better relationship with their child. Um, so it's important to, for us to help them not be afraid to talk to us about that um, and then to help us and for us to give them more information about what, what we can do to help support them with their own mental illness and their symptoms. So another thing is we're talking about maturity level and that kind of thing, and it's not about age because the parents of all ages have different levels of maturity, as you all know. So we just sort of wonder with them how certain situations impact. Like, <clears throat> I wonder how little Susie feels when you're when she's eating and you're playing a video game. Or maybe you think little Johnny meant to hurt your feelings when he turned away, but maybe he just needed a break from the interaction a little bit. And so helping people understand that, and those are a little bit extreme examples, but helping people understand that their child is not uh, trying to hurt their feelings when they act a certain way, but they're trying to tell us something um, with their behavior. And then to look at structure, because structure is important for all of us. It helps us learn what to expect next. And that's another situation where we talked about with multiple caregivers that Kids need to know what to expect. They need to have some routine in their life. 
um, for daily activities, having meals, some structured play so that their child can learn to sit down and finish a task that might be developmentally appropriate for them is really important. And you can see when a child goes to school or Head Start, um, in the families who don't provide those structured activities and structured opportunities, that it's really hard for them to learn to sit down and be in a classroom and pay attention and follow directions and all of those things that they have to learn to do. Um, in terms of communication factors, um, it's helpful for us to observe temperaments of the child and the caregiver and note any of the differences that you see. And then you can reflect on your observations that you see and the similarities. Um, so when you do that, you're showing the parent that you're noticing things and paying attention to even unspoken issues that you know, you're really closely attuned to what's going on with them. It might give the parent the freedom to voice the things they're worried about. And by wondering about those differences, whether they're temperament or sensory preferences, you're not questioning them and how they're parenting, but you're wondering what it's like for the baby and the parent and how do they mesh. So you're helping have empathy for the family and for the child at the same time. Sometimes it's helpful to use a video and you can get a parent to have a friend or family member video them on their phone even. You know, everybody's got a video camera now. Um, and then you can watch it with them and say, oh wow, look at how she really tuned into your face when you were talking to her. Or I wonder why she turned away when the noise got really loud or something like that so that you can help them understand um, and see some things that are a step back from the actual interaction so it's a little bit less intimidating and less threatening. And then we look at factors of regulation and kids who have difficulties regulating their body processes and their own self-regulation. Um, so a lot of our kids in early intervention have problems regulating body process. It can be harder to feed our kids, harder for them to go to sleep, harder for them to get a bath, all sorts of things that are going to be more challenging for that family than what they had originally planned for. Um, you know, we had a kid in our program that had a really bad reflux. And so the whole time that I worked with them, he would throw up all the time. And his mother was one of those people who had a spotless house. Um, she wanted her child to be clean. She wanted them to smell good. Um, she had her entire house covered in those plastic things that they put over couches so that they don't get dirty. Um, and so it was really important for her, that cleanliness and for her child to be clean and smell good and all those things, it was really important to her. And you could tell it was really frustrating. She never really said anything, but she just would just kind of, you could see her face crumple a little bit every time he threw up. And so, you know, we just talked about it a little bit. I was like, you know, your house is so clean. You do such a great job. And it must be really hard when, you know, so-and-so is throwing up all the time. And so we just kind of opened up the conversation and gave her an opportunity to talk about it. And so she kind of understood that I got it, that she was really having a struggle. And so we talked about it. And I couldn't do anything about that reflux, but I could at least have some empathy for her and what she was dealing with. Um, and so I think it's really important for not only for us to speak for the child and have empathy for the child, but also give an opportunity to speak for what the parents are going through. So if you would, use your chat box and tell if you have any tried and true strategies for approaching families about your concerns for their child's healthy and social emotional development.
Okay. Um, a lot of people talk about relationships with families, and I think that is really important. Um, and that it's just another part of development and talking about social emotional health. And ask open ended questions and seize opportunities. Those are great strategies. Um, so and that's what I you know, that's certainly what I would do as well. And I think that that's a, a big thing is we just try to watch for those little opportunities, especially if you have a concern about something, watch for the opportunity and bring it up. Um, it requires a lot of us to educate our families. It requires part time on the part of the service coordinator and the service provider. So we really have to focus on infant mental health as part of this service for our uh, kids in early intervention. We have to learn to recognize those risk factors and try to understand what that tipping point is for more intensive mental health services. And that's always a conversation to have with supervisors and to talk with the service coordinator about what they see and what they're doing when they visit the family. Um, and if we're able to successfully identify what those risk factors are with the family, they may not ever need more intensive mental health services. And that's the whole point is trying to um, prevent uh, the need for more intensive services later. And so um, we all need to learn this. And it's not just for the mental health specialist, it's for all of us. So as everybody has put on here, Relationships are the key, and I really believe that if you can build a solid, honest relationship with people, that you're much more successful in your job, no matter what it is. And so, you know, sometimes people think I'm a little bit of a, of a Pollyanna about this, but I always try to believe that the families I'm working with are doing the best they can at any given time. They want to be a good parent and take care of their children and provide as best they know how. And we all know sometimes that's not good enough, and sometimes it's harmful. But I still believe this because if you don't, the family can feel it. And I really believe they can always feel it. If you enter the relationship with the intention that the family is doing all that they know how to do to the best of their ability, in most situations, you can build a relationship with them. Now, I know there are going to be times when you can't. But that is, you know, I think you have to have that intention and that firm belief in that relationship. And so um, the other thing that we know or that a lot of parents that we're working with also have their own traumas and that sort of thing that make it difficult for them. So we really have a lot to overcome with some families. Um, but we build that relationship and they come to us. Um, and one of the things that we can do is that since we have that primary person in the home doing the coaching activities based on those IFSP goals, that person gets to see that family um, and be able to build that relationship. And so, you know, you always want to be on the lookout for things that you can seize that opportunity to talk to families. So you're spending time in their home talking with them, wondering about their child and the child's feelings, um, what they think their child is feeling, maybe when he plays peekaboo or some other activity that you're doing. Um, help the child express their needs. So if he's you know, kind of looking around and mom's out of the room, you can shout out, hey, mom, he's looking for you. Look at this. You know, and make it a big deal about interpreting what that child's behavior is for the mom. Um, wonder what it's like to be that child if the child has trouble eating or sleeping. Imagine how stressful that is for the child. It's also very stressful for that family, I suspect. So it gives you an opportunity for the family to kind of see you expressing for the child how it feels and then expressing empathy for the parent because you know the parent's probably not sleeping very well either. Um, and then you know we show um, empathy for the family and say, Joe, I wonder what it's like for you when your child doesn't sleep. What's it like when he throws up all the time and you've got to clean it up over and over and over again? Um, or if they have sensory differences, your child seems really kind of quiet and sort of a watcher. Is that hard for you since you seem to be such a go-getter? You know? And just so that they understand that you can see and that you're not accusing or being ugly, but you're just asking the questions and helping them. And so then I say to be ready for the que ask the questions and be ready for the answers that you get. Because sometimes the answers are hard for us to hear. Because you know, a parent might say something like, oh, I let my baby cry it out the other night because I just couldn't do anything. And so maybe crying it out is one of those hot buttons for you. 
So you're going to have to kind of think about how you're going to respond without being judgmental and trying to remember that she could do the, that. That was the best that she could do at the time. Um, so questions about um, you know if mom talks about having depression or something like that, and you can talk with her about how that feels. Um, you can suggest that she meet with a counselor. Um, if a family seems really stressed, you know, ask about how it impacts the relationship with the baby. Is it hard for you to get up at night and take care of your child um, or get the child settled down for bed? Uh, so then that lets you know some places that you can offer some help and support. Um, and so we really need to focus on those open-ended questions and the parent's experience and listen to their expertise because they, um, you know, especially if they have a mental illness, they sort of know what their symptoms are and know what's going on with themselves. Um, so you, you, know, you always want to look at those child outcomes and see where you are with helping families get through um, and make progress in their development. Um, see what their strengths are and find out what the family thinks their strengths are and their barriers to getting to these outcomes um, and help you use that conversation to move them along. So when we're talking about social emotional health, we're reframing the conversation to social and emotional development and how important that is and what, it what the impacts are that it has on every other area of a child's health. We're talking about and providing education on social emotional development, um, building the child's capacity for relationships, developing co-regulation and self-regulation, helping them get their needs met, expressing their feelings, engaging in purposeful activities. Um, and we're helping the family learn to have respect and empathy for their child, not by letting them do whatever they want, but by setting boundaries and um, encouraging them to set boundaries and that sort of thing. And then encouraging human interaction. So you know, now everybody has an iPod or a phone or an iPad or something that they let their kids play with. When I was bringing my kids up, you know, it was the dreaded television babysitter, you know. But people don't have as much human interaction as they used to, and it's hugely important for us to have human interaction. Um, because how will they learn to get their needs met if they don't learn to interact with real people? Um, and then reflection, just talking about what a behavior, what a child's behavior might mean, what they're trying to communicate to us, how their sensory preferences impact their ability to communicate. Sometimes we have to be a little bit of a detective as to why Somebody's um, acting up all of a sudden when they have a loud noise or bright lights or lots of people in activity. So we might ask parents, I wonder if he could concentrate better if we turn down the television or um, you know, close the blinds for a few minutes so that it's not quite as bright. Um, help them have that empathy again. Uh, understand the need for structure and that there's got to be a commitment on the part of the family to provide this structure and stability for their child. And not that it's a chore, but if you can educate them on how important and helpful this will be as they get, their child gets older, um, then they can understand why it's important maybe to sit down together, have a meal, have conversation, talk about little things with their children. Um, developmentally appropriate, of course, but just some, um, you know, how was your day? Even a three-year-old can tell you how their day was, and sometimes a two-year-old can. Um, and just to have some opportunity for that um, and some structured play activities where they sit down and actually finish something. So then I just would challenge people to communicate with their team about what, how they're going to identify what the needs for a family and a child are in their social emotional development. Um, because I know if you're a service provider and you're an OTPT or a speech person, your company wants you to get up at the end of your 45 minutes and leave that family phone and go to your next appointment. So, and I understand that because my company is like that too. So we have to be able to provide those opportunities for communication and, um, and talk with the families about other aspects of their development while we're there. So if you have thought about some things that might inform your practice, if you can put those in the chat box for us and let us know what other questions you have, 
I am finished with my part of the presentation. I would like to tell you that what happens in the early years matters forever. I would thank you for your time and attention. This is a topic I'm very passionate about. I really do feel strongly that what happens early on matters forever. And if you're interested in infant mental health more so, there's the Virginia Association of Infant Mental Health that you can join and meet up with other people who are as feel strongly about this as you do. And there's an Early Childhood Mental Health Institute this month that's going to be great. I'm not sure if you can still register for it. You might email Bonnie Griffa about that. Um, and then there are several other resources that we attached to this presentation handout. Yeah, Dana put the website on there. It's ecmhva.org. And then if anybody has any um, questions or comments, I would be I would love to hear them. And we do have right. my contact information. Yep, that's great, Jeannie. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to open it up. If anybody has any questions that they wanted to ask, feel free. I don't think we missed any questions as we came through. I know there was a comment, Jeannie, that um, your suggestions for reflection with the family will be helpful for Mary Lou. So thank you for that feedback, oh, Mary Lou. Um, and Jeannie has posted links to the PowerPoint and to the resource handout in the in chat, so you guys can um, find out about that. Corey put information about the Mental Health Institute in Stanton on May 12th, so pretty soon. Um, but you yeah. can find more information on that Early Childhood Mental Health um, site. So Jeannie, it looks like we do have a question um, from Stanton Waynesboro. Does anyone know if there's a statewide list of infant mental health providers? She said services in her area are mainly focused for kids 30, 30 months of age and up. Do you know, Jeannie, is there a list that somebody can access? Well, I know that, um, I, you know, I can ask um, Judy Martins. Um, she's the president of our infant, or the Virginia Association of Infant Mental Health. She may know of a list, or it may just be that you can get the list of people who have um, in that area that have joined that group. I'm not sure if there's a specific expertise that anyone has or not. I can certainly try to find that out. And Corey hey, said yes. Okay. Hey Jeannie, this is Corey yeah. Hill. And there is a list on the Early Childhood Mental Health Virginia site that we've posted um, that has a list of those who have in, been endorsed. Um, and so oh, you right. can see who the people, it says List of Virginia Association for Infant Mental Health Endorsed Professionals. And so it has um, a list of the people and what level they are endorsed at, um, and then their contact information and what part of the what region of the state um, they can be reached. So that might help. I think it's important to know that those cadres of people going for endorsement just keep on continuing. So right now the number is a little bit small, but it's growing and um, continues throughout. Thanks, Jeannie. Sure. Yes, thank you, Corey. I didn't realize that list was there. And I would say, you know, if you're really looking for somebody who needs um, some more in-depth kind of counseling and work, that you look at the providers that are endorsed at level three. Um, because I think level one and level two are more um, geared at um, there's some early intervention providers, which are good things. I mean, I just not. I think if you're licensed and you're a counselor, kind of a person that level three might be. And then level one and level two are more child care and, and some other providers like that. Thank you, Jeannie. That's a great point. And thanks, Corey, for popping in. I hope that's helpful. I, I was trying really quick to search that early childhood mental health site, but Corey beat me to it. So that's awesome. Do we have any other questions? I know we have just a couple more minutes, so maybe we'll wait and see if folks have any other questions. Um, and I'm sure since we have Jeannie, we have your email address and your phone number yeah. on the screen. If folks go back and talk to their other folks in their programs and they have questions, they can certainly email you or they're welcome to email me and I can filter the question, you know, filter the questions. Yeah, for you too. that would be great. All right, I'm going to scroll up and see if we have any others. Um, It looks like um, 
It looks like folks are starting to pop off the webinar, which makes sense. I'm sure they've got to get to some intervention visits. Um, well, I think I don't see anybody else I'm looking to to see if anybody else is typing. I don't see any other folks typing. So Jeannie, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I think if, for those of you that are still on the line, like we said, if you have a question later on, feel free to contact me or you can contact Jeannie at her pathways.com email address on the phone. Um, I want to just thank you all for joining the webinar today and invite you to our last webinar of the season in June. We'll have a webinar on traumatic brain injury. So that ought to be a pretty fascinating topic. We have a presenter from um, the Children's Hospital of the King da King's Daughters down here in my area presenting with us. Um, and Corey will be hosting. So feel free to join that in June. And um, we will take a break for the summer. And then we'll be back in the fall. So hopefully we'll see you online next month. Everybody have a wonderful day. Oh, I see Janelle has written, a, uh, is there a certificate of completion for the webinar? Yep, Janelle, you will quickly, um, right after to just receive a survey by email. Once you complete the survey and give us your feedback, you'll have access to your certificate. So you shouldn't have any problem um, having that. And those of you that have more than one person sitting in the room with you watching the webinar, you can share that email with other folks if only one of you actually registered. And they can um, take the survey access to the certificate as well. OK, good. I see Brent and Janelle. Good. Great. Thanks, Janelle. All right. Well, everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a good um, rest of your week. And we will hopefully see you online next month. Thank you. And thanks so much, Jeannie, for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Dana. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.